All right, let's go ahead and kick things off. Uh, welcome everybody to our September town hall. It's already September, holy moly. Um, for those of you who have not met, I'm Maggie. I'm the community product manager for uh, Data Hub. So happy to have you here. We have a, a packed agenda, some really exciting features to roll out. So let's go ahead and get moving on it. Okay, so um, a quick run through of our agenda. We are going to, um, I will give a, a brief community and roadmap update. Um, as always, we will go through our project updates just to kind of let folks know what our recent releases have looked like and how the project is moving along. Um, today, we're joined by some folks from uh, Stripe to give us a case study of how they're using uh, Data Hub uh, in conjunction with Airflow within their Airflow-based ecosystem. Um, then we're gonna take a look at our upcoming uh, column level lineage support. Um, and then we also have a sneak peek at some automated PII classifications. So a ton of really, uh, really awesome items for us to uh, take a look at. So let's take a quick look at our community growth. Um, in the past month, we have welcomed 377 new Slack members. Um, so we're now at about 4,600. Um, I believe this is our, our highest uh, number of uh, new community members to date. Um, we did, if for those of you who have been in um, prayer town halls, we did see a little bit of a sl summer slump, but we're excited to see that uh, folks are, are joining again at a higher rate um, and still you know, seeing nearly 800 weekly active users within our Slack instance. So as always, always, uh, you know, we have a super vibrant and supportive community and really appreciate um, folks for engaging there um, with over 10, almost 11,000 messages sent in Slack. Like it's just a dizzying number of, of conversations. Um, and as always, you guys know that I, how much I love a good Slack emoji. So we had uh, just shy of 600 Slack emojis this month. Um, so one other thing that we like to look at as a group is our um, just kind of understanding how our, our support volume is going, uh, both in contributions to the project, but then also support within the community. So um, taking a look at our GitHub uh, uh, throughput, so between PRs and issues, um, we did see a big spike at the beginning of, uh, uh, of September. So the week of the 5th, we had uh, 72 PRs open, which I think is a, an all-time uh, weekly high. Um, and then, you know, in this last uh, last four weeks, we're averaging around 56 new PRs open in a given week, and we're doing a really good job of kind of keeping track or keeping pace with merging those um, and kind of maintaining parity there. Um, and, you know, this is a slight, just kind of like the average of 56 uh, PRs in a week over week basis is slightly higher, about seven higher uh, than the four weeks prior. So we're definitely seeing a, a ton of really great volume coming in there. In terms of our support channels within Slack, we saw an average of 644 support messages across all of our channels in the past four weeks, which was a slight decrease from um, the four weeks prior. The majority of, of questions that are coming in are between the ingestion and troubleshoot channels. Um, and you know, this is really uh, this is really kind of a call for support from the community. If you're able to jump in and help, we really, really genuinely appreciate that support. Um, the more that we have community supporting one another, the more we can turn our focus to new features, moving those uh, those community led contributions through the project, et cetera. Um, taking a quick look at our Q3 roadmap. So we are officially at the end of Q3. We've uh, we've made some really great progress on our lineage enhancements, which we're going to demo this round. Um, advanced search, we actually demoed that last month. Um, so and and we are planning on uh, getting that through, I believe, in the next release. Um, so that advanced search uh, functionality will be coming out uh, eminently. Um, and then a couple of things that we still have planned, um, removing Confluent schema registry as a hard requirement. Um, this has come up in the community as a blocker a handful of times, but we're actually starting to see some pretty um, reliable workarounds there. So we're kind of weighing the pros and cons of uh, ex explicitly removing that requirement versus just kind of providing best practices and more gu concrete guidance about how to work around that requirement. Um, so more to come in coming weeks. Um, and then in terms of our Q4 roadmap, we're, we're kind of putting some finishing touches on it. I will be sure, I don't have anything to share with you today, but I'll be sure to announce it within our Slack community um, and then also through our newsletter, et cetera, when we have that up and running. One thing we have on our, um, on our, our uh, kind of to-dos for October is to roll out a crowdsourced glossary. 
So the idea here is, you know, there are standard glossaries across industries. So uh, glossaries like FIBO, um, Microsoft has a common data model. There's Medra for uh, kind of like the healthcare industry. Um, the idea here is like, let's just take what resources that already exist, format them so they're easy to ingest into Data Hub, and then have just kind of a common repo that uh, folks within the community can contribute to, rely upon, um, and really just kind of take that dry approach where we don't all need to be kind of recreating the wheel from scratch every single time. So uh, more to come here, but just wanted to get this on folks' radar that we are uh, we will be announcing this within the community or within our, our normal channels and our newsletter, and we would love uh, contributions there, uh, especially for folks that are in you know, kind of niche industries or, or actually, you know, just have expertise in industries, uh, we'd love to really build out a really robust set of uh, glossary resources there. Uh, one other thing to call out, Shashanka is rolling out a blog series on Metadata Day. So for those of you who are not aware, earlier, I believe it was in May, we, we had a an event called Metadata Day where we talked about best practices around modern data governance and code-driven uh, data governance. So if you've not already, these are fantastic reads. Uh, there's a ton of really great uh, uh, insights and information packed in there. So you can uh, find those easily just by going to blog.datahubproject.io um, and stay tuned. There'll be a couple other uh, articles coming out in there. We'll also be linking to those in announcements as they roll out. Um, but yeah, definitely worth a read. Some really great insights from both Shashanka, but also industry leaders that we we spoke with on metadata or during metadata day. Couple of things, uh, in-person events coming up. John Joyce and I are gonna be in Budapest next week speaking at Crunch, which is a, a data conference in Budapest. Uh, we will be talking about uh, how to start cleaning up your data swamp using modern data governance. If you are in the, if you are attending the conference, please let us know, we'd love to meet up. If you're just in Budapest or in the area, also let us know, we'd love to meet up. And uh, I haven't been to that part of Europe, so I'm super, super excited. Uh, the other thing is that um, Herschel and I are going to be traveling to New Orleans for Coalesce in October. I will be on the um, the HEX panel uh, sponsor, uh, hosted by Claire Carroll and Izzy Miller from the HEX team. Um, so please, if you're going to be at Coalesce, again, please let me and Herschel know. We'd love to meet up with you in person and, uh, and or come to the session. Well, it should be a fun one. Okay. Community shout outs. This is my personally my favorite part. We have just an outstanding community of supportive and wonderful human beings. We love to give them the uh, the appreciation and gratitude that they so deeply deserve. So in the past month or so, uh, we've had just a ton of folks jump up and, and support, uh, provide support within the community. Um, as always, massive shout out to XL. Um, XL is in all of our support channels, constantly giving really great guidance and jumping in when, um, you know, when otherwise the core team isn't able to. And also just these really wonderful humans here that are, are helping and this is everything from, you know, kind of hands-on troubleshooting um, or, you know, kind of like providing uh, links out to existing resources or prior conversations. Um, so we really genuinely appreciate all the support that, that these folks are giving us. Um, and then let's do a handful of code shout outs. Shashanka, I'm going to hand this one over to you. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's been... This was a tough one because I looked at kind of the contributions that came in in the last uh, four or five weeks, and it's been tremendous. Uh, we'll look at the stats in a bit, but these were the code contributions that I thought were um, stand out, both in terms of their impact as well as the uh, amount of changes that were required. So David, um, you know, you might have known him from before. He contributed the uh, protobuf schema module um, back in the day. Um, and he's back contributing kind of our upgrade to Java 11. Um, and so the new uh, master, basically uh, open source branch now builds on Java 11. And it was a big change and uh, really glad that uh, we got this in. Thank you, David. The next one is from Alexi, who figured out that our checkpoint state uh, was actually pretty large. And he figured out a very creative and simple way to compress it and tested it out and made it backwards compatible. And that was amazing. And so now for people who are dealing with stateful ingestion and lots and lots of uh, entities getting ingested and taking up a lot of space, you could just turn on um, this compression flag and you'll see your state kind of get compressed a lot. So really big contribution. 
Uh, Amanda um, has been uh, contributing all over the stack, actually. Uh, we've, we've gotten front-end contributions uh, from them and now um, also got a contribution on standardizing the ownership change event payload. This is important when you're writing Data Hub actions, which need to do something when an ownership changes. And uh, again, a very core contribution to the um, platform. And finally, um, a lot of people like Data Hub because it supports extensibility in a strongly typed way. You can add additional aspects to existing entities. Um, and we got a contribution here from um, P. Ghazanfari. I'm sure I'm butchering that last name, <laughs> but um, it's a really important contribution uh, because they figured out that we were supporting entity, new custom entities uh, in the model, but we actually weren't supporting it from the outside in. And um, this was a really impactful contribution. And so now you can actually extend the metadata model from outside and you can add new entities as well. So it's a, it's a huge contribution. And I think that was not one all. More. <laughs> yeah, there's also, I was just going through them and there's like a ton of really impactful ones actually this time. So last but not the least, uh, Presto on Hive, it's uh, an, actually an emerging, very important connector. It allows you to connect to the backend database and pull out Hive metadata in a much more efficient manner. Um, and Azo added uh, support for both stateful uh, ingestion for that connector, as well as uh, subtypes and a lot of um, general improvements. So thanks a lot. These are all deep contributions. They are not superficial. They're not five lines of doc changes. I mean, there's a ton of that also, and we really love it, but these are like serious code contributions. So I'm really happy to see this level of uh, contributions coming in. Awesome. Back to you, man. All right. Um... So one thing that I like to call out in addition to your wonderful code contributions and supporting the community is that, you know, there are a ton of ways that you can contribute back to the project. Uh, one of those is by considering contributing to our community led blog. So this is led by myself and um, Elizabeth Cohen, who's on uh, my team. And we'd love to team up with you to contribute to the data hub blog, hear about your, your experiences. Uh, using Data Hub, modern approaches to data governance, uh, uh, how you evaluate a Data Hub, et cetera. Resources like this are extremely valuable for other community members who are trying to get a sense of what problems you can solve with Data Hub or roadblocks you hit along the way or how you approached the rollout, you know, kind of all of these kind of bigger questions. Um, so again, like there are so many ways to contribute back to the community. It doesn't have to be just code. It doesn't have to be troubleshooting support. It can be sharing your experiences and, and kind of getting the word out there. Okay, oh, I, I ruined the surprise. Um, I am completely overjoyed to announce that I am no longer the only community person. I am now part of a team of two. We have brought on Paul Logan as our DevRel lead, and I will pass it over to you, sir, to give us a little bit of your background. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Paul. Nice to meet you. I am a developer relations specialist. Uh, I will be a developer relations lead here at April. Um, Previously, I have done similar work at Postman and Slack. Um, at Postman, I did a lot of you know, speaking conferences and meetups, teaching people how to use the tool. And at Slack, I worked on their API site. Um, here at Acrol, I really hope to be able to help you as a community. Um, one of the things I'm going to be working on is docs, and uh, as well as producing content that will help people get started and really drive more value from Data Hub and Acrol Managed Solutions tool. Um, a fun fact about me is that in between working at Acrol right now and working at Slack, I threw hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, which is a continuous footpath from the Mexican border to the Canadian border. Uh, yeah, and and uh, please, if you have any questions, anything that any burning questions about the community or about the documentation or about anything Data Hub or Acrol, please reach out to me at Twitter. My handle is under, or lol underscore Pogan, um, and you will see me around in the community. Thank you very much. Back to you, Maggie. So happy you're here, Paul. We have a ton of really great things coming. Um, and yeah, I feel like we're just only scratching the surface of, of what we can do to support the community. I'm really excited. <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on to <laughs> Shoshanka said in chat, I'm planning to sleep eight hours a night again. A girl can dream, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a dream. <laughs> All right, let's move over to project updates. Um, so Shoshanka, do you want me to go through contributors really quick? Yeah. Cool. All right. So um, 
in the month of September, we had a massive number of PRs come in that we moved, that we merged. Um, we merged nearly 300 PRs between the main data hub project, as well as um, our Acroll data hub helm project. Um, this is literally 100 more PRs than the month prior. Uh, so we have been a very busy group over here. Not only that, there's 16 first time contributors. And in total, we had 48 people contribute to the project. Um, I, I'm personally just like overwhelmed by how freaking cool this is that we're not only like cranking out a tremendous amount of volume, but also welcoming so many dang uh, new contributors and really building out this uh, really vibrant and supportive community. So um, massive shout out to these folks. Really appreciate all of your support along the way. Cool. Um, moving over from contributors to project updates. Um, as you've probably seen, the platform and the application continues to move forward super rapidly. Uh, on the user experience side, we've we've actually done two releases in the last month. So yay for bi-weekly releases. We're going to stay much more on point with that. Um, so on the user experience side, we've added a lot of new capabilities. Uh, you'll see a much snappier experience on the lineage visualization. Um, we've allowed support for the glossary term groups to be also um, covered by the permissions engine. We now have a search bar for the data set schema tab. That's a sneaky Easter feature. If you're not careful and you've got your blinders on and you're expecting to see schemas just the same way you've been seeing them before, you might miss it. So make sure to look at that next schema page and look for that search bar. Um, uh, it, it's very useful for lots and when you know you have data sets with lots and lots of columns in them and a lot of in, improvements to ingestion overall but specifically for ui based ingestion uh, i think we've demoed some of it uh, previously you can now view live logs during execution you can view ingestion summaries both for cli based runs as well as for ui based runs um, some more improvements on the looker side um, when you're searching we actually support better search matching uh, when you're searching for a measure or a dimension we actually not only surface the explorers or views that they're part of, but also the charts or looks uh, and the dashboards that reference those fields. So we're actually starting to see the power of lineage kind of kicking in uh, in the search experience as well, which is great. Um, moving on to metadata integrations, um, we now have a BigQuery beta source. Harshal will cover it as part of the ingestion upgrades. A bunch of improvements in browse path capabilities, um, improved documentations, you can read it. Uh, I'm not going to read through every single one of these. Um, lots of improvements. I'll let Harshal actually cover them in the next slide. And last but not the least, the dev experience on the platform continues to get better. Um, you can now restore indices using the API. Uh, it was something that was only known as a dark art for people who knew how to uh, you know, run uh, kubectl commands uh, appropriately. But now you can actually trigger it through the service API. Um, Improvements to impact analysis, we've added caching. And support for patch, which we demoed last uh, town hall, is now in the product. Um, there are some handy docs coming that will help you understand how to emit patch updates for adding ownership, tags, uh, terms to fields without having to read, modify, right? And uh, personal access tokens are not going to expire on you anymore if you don't want them to. So we now support uh, forever tokens uh, for personal access tokens. Python 3.6 is deprecated and some big announcements coming up. If we hit next, we are no longer uh, on Java 8. We have moved to Java 11 for our builds. So if you've got a fork, remember when you're going to rebase or merge uh, you know, OSS back into your fork, you need to rerun, you set up your development environment to Java 11. Hopefully this is actually better and not worse for most people. And as a result, this was the last 0.8.x release. So the next release is going to be 0.9.0. Uh, and that reflects kind of a, both a maturing of the platform and a growing up of Data Hub, but also the fact that we are now going to be Java 11 up uh, going forward. That's it from me. And we're going to go over to Harshal really quick for ingestion updates because we have a bunch. Yeah, so Shashanka mentioned a couple of these on the previous slide. Uh, we have a new BigQuery connector that is in beta right now and has a ton of improvements, much, you know, supports like nested structs and parsing that out. You know, you don't have to configure a separate usage connector. So that's improving rapidly. 
the Snowflake beta connector is no longer beta. It's now stable. The old one has been renamed to Snowflake Legacy and will probably get removed. That new connector has new support for column level lineage, which is super exciting. Um, and then it has a bunch of other improvements around performance and things. So would love for, for people to, to start giving that a spin. In addition to that, look ML, we heard that, you know, cloning your Git repo separately and then running look ML ingestion against that repo is kind of a pain. And so now we can automatically clone your Git repo, which means you can also configure look ML ingestion through the UI and you don't have to run it yourself. Uh, and then the looker source have made a ton of performance improvements. So uh, if you used to get those issues around uh, the, the process getting killed because of out of memory, uh, looker is a lot more efficient on that now. DBT supports column level meta mappings. So you can add terms and tags to the columns, um, which is super important if you want to you know, at tag something as sensitive and then use column level lineage to take a look at where else that sensitive column is used. Um, on Tableau, we now support chart usage. We actually are at, added a new aspect to the chart type and Tableau now supports that. Uh, and then on the Presto and Hive, we got a great community contribution adding stateful ingestion um, and also extracting some, some descriptions and view uh, data. And then finally in the core, uh, checkpoint state compression, and you can now delete and roll back things um, like time series aspects, time series aspects being things like data quality over time. You can go and delete that data or roll it back if it was bad from an ingestion run. So yeah, tons of stuff. I see there's a, a bunch of questions in chat that I'll that I'll get to answering as well. But yeah, back to you, Maggie. All right, I'm going to hand this over to Aditya for a quick update on uh, inviting users. Hey everyone, uh, if you remember last town hall, we unveiled role-based access control on Data Hub so that you know you don't have to fiddle around with the policy system like unless you want to. Um, so we had this uh, inviting new users onto Data Hub feature, and we decided to spice things up a little bit. And now um, when you send invite links to new users, you can configure specific links for um, the roles that we have on Data Hub. So you can send users that you want to be admin users or reader users separate links. And when they sign up on Data Hub, they'll automatically be assigned to this role. Uh, this is also useful because if you have existing Data Hub users that are, um, you know, were added through other ways like SSO, you can actually send them the same link. And instead of uh, being prompted to sign up as a new user, they'll just be assigned to that role, which will um, replace whatever role they had before. So we hope that this makes it easier to, um, you know, assign people to roles. And um, just as a quick note, if you also want to uh, not have someone assigned to a role, there's an option for no role in case you're already using our policy system and want to just continue to use that. That's it. Um, please let me know if you have any feedback on this feature. Thanks. Amazing. All right. Woo, 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 woo. This is jumping all around. Okay. So um, we are going to move over to our community case study. Uh, today, we are joined by Divya from Stripe. So Divya, I will go ahead and hand this over to you. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so yeah, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Divya Manahar and I'm a software engineer in data platform at Stripe. I'm based in Seattle, Washington and I joined a little over a year ago as a new grad. Um, so Stripe has been ramping up with using Data Hub over the past few months in order to solve some of our data observability and timeliness issues that we've been facing. This has included building our own client, which we use to emit metadata about our data sets and batch data jobs, as well as some additional UI features, which we have built um, to fill in some of our past observability gaps. So I'm here to talk about how Stripe has integrated with Data Hub and demo a few of these new UI features as well. Um, so what is Stripe? For some background, Stripe is a payment services provider that lets merchants accept credit and debit card payments online. Stripe's products power payments for online and in-person retailers, 
subscription businesses, software platforms, and marketplaces. And we also help companies beat fraud, send invoices, get financing, manage business spend, and more. So Data Platform at Stripe has been trying to solve a number of data observability and timeliness concerns over the past year. And we operate the support, um, we operate and support the infrastructure for complex batch data pipelines and closely monitor their landing times and additional performance metrics every day. Um, this is like have has proven to be a significant amount of manual work for the pipelines owning teams. And teams that own these pipelines were required to write complex database queries or manually click through hundreds of job status pages in order to get informed about how their jobs have been performing over time. Owners also have service level agreements or SLAs in place for themselves and their downstream customers regarding landing time, latency, and freshness of their data. As a result, teams have resorted to building their own pipeline-specific dashboards for more detailed and up-close observability into their job performances, causing a disconnect of information and observability tooling across organizations. Um, for example, one of our most important data pipelines is called the Unified Activity Report, or UAR for short. This data pipeline consists of nearly a thousand data jobs with very complex dependencies and essentially generates a summary of Stripe users' transactions at the end of each month. This pipeline has groups of data jobs owned by various teams at Stripe, and there's a strict 72 hour deadline for this entire pipeline completing. So at the end of each month, designated runners from each owning team would need to manually pull up their job status pages and dashboards and communicate with each other the progress of their portion of the pipeline. The only method for determining the current status um, and delays in the pipeline was to rely on runners to communicate that in our UAR Slack channel. And there's a lot of stress and manual work involved in monitoring UAR every month. And answering a question as simple as how far are we currently in the UAR pipeline was often really difficult to answer. As a result of this lack of observability into historical trends of data job performance, as well as critical pipeline statuses, we wanted a unified data catalog that all teams could visit to get quick and easy insights into their jobs runtime, latency, SLA misses, as well as the team's pipeline status and estimated delivery times. And Data Hub was a great solution for this as it provides complete discoverability into metadata about jobs and data sets. And we were able to build some additional UI features to support our most important observability needs. Um, in order to set up some context with how we build our client and how we are sending metadata over to Data Hub, I wanted to talk about our system for running our data jobs, which is Airflow. Airflow is essentially our infrastructure for scheduling and running batch data jobs, which are known as tasks, and is currently our only metadata source for Data Hub. We have thousands of tasks running every hour, which produce data sets that our consumers care about. However, there's a disconnect between the data sets that are produced and the data jobs which produce them. So in order to make this connection for a particular task, we're often required to search through runtime logs to determine what are the input and output data sets being consumed and produced. Additionally, the Airflow UI doesn't give us much flexibility in creating dashboards to showcase insights into historical trends and job performance, as well as showcasing the dependencies between the tasks. Um, the UI is more useful for just monitoring the current state of a particular task, as well as debugging task failures through logs. Additionally, in Airflow, we have many cross-DAG dependencies that are not visible in the UI, um, meaning that in order to under get an understanding of complete dependencies between tasks and data sets end to end, we need to manually click through various tasks and DAGs and build a mental moderate model of what our entire pipeline looks like. So we can see in this video, just to view the relationship between two tasks that are in different DAGs, we have to click through many pages to understand that. So doing this for a pipeline such as UAR is nearly impossible given the amount of tasks and data sets involved, as well as the complex um, dependencies that exist. So here we can see how our client, um, how we set up our client in order to emit metadata change proposals to Data Hub. So once a worker pulls a task added to the queue by the Airflow scheduler, the task instance will start running. Um, just before the task begins to run, we call our client to emit metadata about the task instance. So this includes the data flow event, which corresponds to the Airflow DAG, the data job event, which corresponds to the Airflow task with information including upstream and downstream data jobs, as well as custom properties, including SLAs that were configured on the job, as well as the jobs owning team. All of this information is pulled from the task configuration code, which is written by job owners. 
Additionally, we send a data process instance event, which is which includes information about the specific task instance run, such as the start and end time, um, the state of the task instance, and the logical date for the task to run. And finally, we emit two sets of dataset events, one for upstream datasets that the job takes as input, and secondly, for the downstream datasets that the job produces. And all these ed ed um, entities exist on the open source data hub project already. Um, and these metadata change proposal events are then emitted to a Kafka topic where the schema for the event is looked up in the schema registry to help serialize the payload to Kafka. And ultimately the data is ingested by the data hub metadata service or data hub PMS. So one thing to note um, is that we have anywhere from five to 30 tasks emitting metadata to data hub every second. And a single task can potentially produce over hundred entities based on its tasks and data set dependencies. Um, so due to the sheer volume of events being emitted, we were originally experiencing some load issues causing a delay in the Kafka consumer. Um, so we decided to only send over the data process instance entity on completion callbacks and not start callbacks um, of the task instance, such as when the task succeeds or fails, goes up for retry or is skipped. And in order to reduce the number of entities being emitted, since really the only information changing between the start and completion callbacks of a task instance um, is the end date and the state of the task instance. We use the callback type to determine what instance run result type to send over to Data Hub. And additionally, we have configured a five second timeout on the client in order to prevent any significant changes in task runtime that could cause delays in our critical pipelines. So next up, I'm gonna be talking about some of our most critical observability needs and the UI features that we've built as solutions. So to begin with, users wanted an easy way to track SLA misses and historical trends in their jobs start and landing times, which is essentially the duration between the logical date for the task instance to run and the time that the task has started or completed. So as an example, this is a data job that we have um, in Data Hub called IC plus daily IC plus fees. Um, so users can, job owners can essentially set different types of SLAs on their task. They can set both started by and finished by SLAs. And for each of those, they can set different levels. So they can set either a warn level or an error level. Um, so this page kind of exposes different SLA misses um, as well as the latest run for this um, task. So we can see for the latest run, it was scheduled on 927. Um, we can see when it started running, how long it ran for, and we can see now it's in the finished state. We can see exactly what time it finished and how much time was remaining until it hit its end error SLA. Um, so this job doesn't have any start SLA set, but we also expose information about how many runs um, finished over SLA, the percentage, and on average, how much we were delayed by. We can select a number of runs to view here. And this chart kind of shows us um, trends in landing times. So the bottom value of each of these columns corresponds to the start time of the task instance, and the top value corresponds to the end time. So the, the taller the column, um, the longer the task took to run. So we can kind of see a trend here. Um, blue means we didn't miss any SLAs. Yellow means we missed a worn SLA, and red means we missed the error SLA. And for each of these task instance runs, we can see more granular information, including the execution date, when it started and ended and duration, the state and how long is left until SLA or how far we went over SLA. Um, and if we want to kind of triage, okay, why did I miss SLA on this day? We can click into here and see the actual airflow task and logs. So yeah, this is kind of our timeliness page and this exists on all of our data jobs. Um, so one of the next concerns that we wanted to address was being able to quickly and easily determine the status of an entire pipeline. So for example, in the case of UAR, which I mentioned earlier, we wanted a dashboard that all runners could visit at the end of each month to track the progress of the pipeline so owners were not reliant on Slack messages to triage delays. So this is kind of what our pipeline timeliness dashboard looks like for UAR specifically. So again, UAR consists of nearly a thousand tasks and we didn't want to display all a thousand tasks in this view. So we kind of split up the entire pipeline into chunks, um, which are logical groupings of tasks, mostly in a chronological order owned by different teams. And um, those chunks we call segments. And for each of those segments, 
we identified two or three kind of critical tasks within that segment. So that might be the terminal task in the segment or just a critical task that teams typically monitor during the UAR run. So on the left-hand side, the, this is a list of all of the different segments that we have listed in a chronological order. So we can see for this pipeline, we're somewhere between the daily estimate segment and the Spark model cost segment. Um, but of course, since there's a lot of complex dependencies here, some segments run in parallel. So we can see that this segment is still in progress. So um, we can also, for this entire dashboard, choose a specific run to look at. And we can see the pipeline's entire status. It's currently in progress, as well as an estimated landing time and what the current time is. And within each of these individual segments, we can view exactly what tasks we are um, looking at. And within each of these tasks, we can also see um, more metadata. So the state of the latest task run, um, who to contact in case there are any delays or SLA misses, um, the average landing time, current run landing time, as well as a link to the Airflow task in the Airflow UI. And we can also, for each task, view more information about previous runs. So we display the seven latest runs as well as the previous same day of week run and previous end of month run. And the reason that we do that is we learned from our users that whenever they're um, monitoring their tasks in this view, they wanna be able to compare their landing time to previous landing times. So we wanted to kind of show all that information so they could easily estimate when their task would land or how long it's expected to run for. And we also discovered that a lot of tasks have um, different run durations based on the day of week or the time of month. So we wanted to kind of display all of that information. And again, we can kind of see this for all views. Um, and some of these tasks don't have SLAs. And we also have kind of a naive um, predictions for when these tasks will land. Um, and also one other thing to note is that in order to, this page is entirely self-serve. So users can actually just from the data hub UI go and add tasks into segments here. So for example, um, this risk.merchant state task is in the risk DS segment. Um, and so if we go to the data job page for this task, we can see that it has the UAR entity on it and we use tags to define what segment it's in. So we kind of um, overloaded tags in that way. And so we can see that we defined it as the risk DS tag. So coming back here, um, finally, we wanted to give users a self-serve way to also build their own historical SLA tracking dashboard in Data Hub and have the flexibility to add whatever data jobs they deem critical to the page. This also gives leadership a high level um, view of how our platform is performing for our major customers. So this is our historical SLA tracking page um, for our most critical data jobs. So we can see in a timeline view um, how much over or under SLA they were, and it's split up by team. So these are part of the growth team and these tasks are part of the cost team. Um, and for each of these tasks, we expose information about the percentage of times they met their deadline, um, P90 and P80 delivery, and a link to the task um, as well. And, and so if since these are all on the same timeline, if we see a lot of red, say on August 1st, for example, then we would know, okay, like our infrastructure must have been degraded or having issues at that time. Um, and so this is very useful for our leadership to kind of track how we're doing. And again, for each of these runs, we can see more granular information, including um, the state, the execution date, um, and start and end times. And again, this page is completely self-serve, so users can go into um, a specific job and just add it to this entity and it will appear in this page. So I actually wanted to talk about how um, we have this um, critical data jobs and UAR um, entity set up. So we actually created a new entity called user defined reports, which both of these sit under. This is very, very similar to the current domains entity that already exists in Data Hub, um, except we can add multiple of these user-defined reports to a particular, to a single data job. Um, and additionally, for a user-defined report, we can select if we want it to be either a pipeline timeliness, which is that UAR dashboard that you saw, or historical timeliness dashboard. So we can create a new user-defined report here, select what type that we want it to be, and add data jobs to that to build either a pipeline, pipeline timeliness dashboard or historical SLA tracking dashboard.
So yeah, um, to wrap things up, we are continuing to work with our most prominent data owners and Airflow users to build additional features that um, we can help them monitor their data jobs. Um, we are building additional features, including data job expected landing times with regards to upstream landing times and delays. And we've also done a bit of work to just expose job ownership information in the UI. Um, we will eventually add more system integrations and expand on the user defined report entity to allow for different types of reporting as more use cases pop up as well. Um, we're also hoping to upstream some of these features to the open source project once we gavel internally. Um, and we're planning to do that sort of one by one for each of these features. We've had a great experience integrating with Data Hub, and it's already proved to be super useful um, as a tool for our data job owners. So thank you so much, everyone, and I hope you enjoyed the demo. And you can find me in the Data Hub Slack space, and my email is listed here as well. So thank you. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Divya. Um, highly recommend taking a look at chat. There's a ton of love in there. Um, I think it's safe to say we're pretty much blown away at the work you guys have put together. And wow, thanks for walking us through that. It's like my mind is blown in terms of all of the things that we can be doing and will be doing in the near future. It's so cool. All right. Um, we are going to move on to Calm Level Lineage. Um, Gabe and Chris, I will hand it over to you. I presume you are sharing. Yeah, I can start by sharing my screen. Um, thanks again, Divya and Stripe folks for sharing that demo. It was really exciting to see. And I think if you guys don't contribute back to the open source, you're gonna see a mob of people with USBs and hard drives showing up at your office soon. So that was very cool. I really like seeing it. Um, so today, Chris and I are very excited to give you a further update on column level lineage in Data Hub. Harshal teased this a little bit in the ingestion update, and we're going to be able to talk a little bit more about what that will look like holistically uh, across Data Hub. So before I get started in what we did, I want to give a background about why column level lineage might be helpful. And if any of these use cases sound helpful or, or resonate with you, then listen on, because I think you'll be really excited to hear what we have to share. So first of all, uh, why column level lineage? And it's really about trying to understand how columns were calculated and how columns are being used. So for example, um, you might be interested in, for a given column, does it read from any sensitive data? So was sensitive data ever used in constructing the value of a particular column? Or maybe um, what approach was used to come up with a given aggregation? Was this metric calculated using created at, or did it use updated at as a field um, to, cal to calculate? Uh, other, you know, other, uh, another example might be what sort of count was used um, to create a derived field. At the same time, you also might be interested in understanding how was a given column being used? So um, if you're interested in maybe deprecating a field or changing a field to meaning, what is gonna be the entire impact of that? Who all depends on a given field in particular? You also might be interested for a given metric or given dimension, uh, what dashboards visualize this slice? Um, how can I see this metric being uh, visualized across all my different tools or you know, what sort of charts or dashboards are using a metric as a given cut? Um, so all these different types of use cases come about really understanding how do columns depend on each other across your entire uh, data ecosystem. And if this, these use cases sound useful, listen on because we have a very exciting update to share. Um, so a little drum roll. What we're introducing is the Data Hub column lineage experience. And this is a real screenshot, not a fake one. So the column lineage experience comes with a few different things. Firstly, this is something that already exists, APIs for emitting column level lineage. So if you have this metadata already, you can emit this to Data Hub as of today uh, and get it into the system. We're also introducing something that Harshal teased just a few minutes ago, which is automatic column level lineage extraction from Snowflake and from Looker. And something that we're about to show to you is visualizing column lineage in the Lineage Explorer. So being able to see not just connections at the data set level, but being able to expand that out and seeing how columns depend on each other, both from an upstream 
and downstream direction. And then finally, on top of that, using impact analysis to understand not just one hop, but the entire collection of entities across your whole data stack that depend on a column or in the inverse direction, the entire set of entities that were consumed to produce a column, not just one hop or two hops away, but as many hops across all different data platforms and uh, different data set entity types. Um, so this is what we're going to be demoing to you in just a moment in terms of what's coming next. So Snowflake and Looker automatic column level uh, lineage extraction. This is coming out in the next PyPy release that's happening this week. Some user experience changes that you're gonna see very soon. So this is gonna be starting to come out in the next server releases. Point nine will include column level lineage visualization on the Viz tab. And then after that, we'll be fast following with uh, column level lineage impact analysis to see those many, the list of entities that depend on it from many hops away. We're also going to be extracting and, vi and visualizing transformation logic from Snowflake and Looker. So you'll be able to see, in addition to um, the, the connection itself, you'll be able to see the logic that was used to produce that column. Um, we're also going to be rolling out automatic column level lineage extraction from BigQuery and Redshift and Spark and Tableau later on. So that's the setup. Now to see it in action, I'm gonna cut over to my friend Chris and he'll be able to show you uh, what it looks like um, in action. Awesome, thanks Gabe. Um, I might take over sharing screen, would you mind? There we go, all right. So hey everyone. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be giving you a sneak peek at what column level lineage looks like in the Data Hub UI. So previously we could only show you table level lineage, which is what you see right here. Uh, but for all the reasons that Gabe previously mentioned, uh, there's a strong desire to see exactly what's going on between the columns of these tables and all the relationships that happen there. So I'm happy to show you that you can now toggle this little switch and boom. There you go. You can now see all of the columns for all of these tables, if they're available, and all the relationships that we have between these columns. So let's dig into this data together and uh, think of a few potential scenarios where column level lineage might solve some problems that you have. So in this first scenario, let's imagine that you're looking at Looker and you see that lifetime purchase amount is actually larger than you would expect it to be based on your understanding of this data and where it's coming from and everything like that. So I want to do some uh, research to see exactly how we're getting lifetime purchase amount, what's coming, like where it's coming from, and see if there's anything off. So what I can do is I can hover over this column and I can actually see the whole lineage, both upstream and downstream. As you can see, I can hover any column that has lineage and then uh, analyze it from that point. But on top of that, we can also click and lock in that lineage, which can be pretty useful as this graph gets pretty complicated, as you can imagine. You can zoom in, drag, all that sort of good stuff. So let's think about that scenario where lifetime purchase amount is inflated. So let's look back. We see that it's also coming from this looker view and the snowflake table, both with columns of the same name. And then if we go back another hop, we can see that the snowflake table purchases, it's coming from total amount. And then it clicks. Actually, total amount is the wrong column. It should be coming from purchase amount. That's why it's probably inflated. Awesome, column level and each helps solve the issue at hand. And now we have an action item to go fix how we're getting this data. So that's one scenario. Let's imagine a different one where, let's take this uh, users table, for example. Users has a uh, column email, and we know that this email column has an issue where we're not updating it properly for some reason. So I wanna see everything that's downstream of this email column in order, let's click on that, in order to see everything that could be affected by this potentially wonky data. So we can use that same situation where we hover and click and lock it in. And now you can see all of the downstream columns that are being affected by this email column, a whole bunch of other email columns, as you could potentially imagine, from all these different tables and explorers, affecting potentially many different assets that you have in your uh, data inventory. So you could also imagine that this graph could get pretty wild as the number of nodes increases and like these columns fan out. And it might just be kind of hard to understand how many things are being affected and what is actually happening here. So as Gabe also mentioned, 
we now allow you to have impact analysis as well on the specific column level. So let me show you that. So let's go to this user's uh, uh, profile page. And then we're here on the schema tab. You can see this email column that we care about. We know that this one's the one that might be affecting things downstream of it. We have this new menu here on the right where you can click and you can jump straight into column level lineage for the email column. You can see that email is selected here in this column level lineage dropdown. And so everything that we're seeing here is going to be one hop away, because it's one degree of dependency right now, from the email column. All of these assets directly uh, consume this email column. And we also call out what specific columns on these other assets are uh, consuming this email column. Um, on top of that, you can go two hops away or three plus, AKA all of the data that consumes this email column, everything that could be affected by this broken column that might be then throwing data off entirely elsewhere. So now you have this whole list and you have all the columns specifically on each of these entities that, you, that are consuming this and ca care about it. But if you're curious, for example, one that's further downstream, like this act, active customer LTV is four hops away, you're curious about like what path actually it takes to get there, you can go to it and you can click on the column itself. And now you see the specific path from user's email all the way to active customer LTV email and everything in between. And then this also supports potentially multiple paths. You can imagine where the case there's a divergence of data and then a convergence later on as it like goes down we would just have a list of multiple different paths going down showing every possible situation where users email connects to active customer ltv email and then on top of that um we also let's say you're looking at this column level lineage but then you are getting tired of it you want to see the table level lineage you can always toggle column level lineage off and now you see all the table level lineage you can always toggle it back on and of course, you can select the dropdown and see any different column that you care about specific for impact analysis on that column. All right, that's it for me, gang. Amazing. Chris and Gabe, thank you both so much. Again, ton of love in chat. Um, this is one, column level lineage has been a long time coming and highly requested and highly desirable throughout uh for for many many uh weeks and months <laughs> so i am just overjoyed that we are making this available um and man that looks super slick all right we have one more uh round to go and i will share my screen one moment please all right hello everyone i'm slow co-founder and cto of actual data uh i've interacted with many of you before on community slack but I Believe it or not, this is my first town hall presentation. I've been kind of training for the last 18 months to meet the high standards set by Maggie. So I'm finally ready. Um, well, today I am excited to share with you a preview of something that we've been working on, automatically detecting PII types to power compliance and uh, other governance use cases. Uh, as you all know, annotating data sets and columns with the right PII types is important for many governance use cases like access control, applying the right masking policies, GDPR deletion, and what have you. Uh, Data Hub already supports a very rich business glossary feature, which uh, Professor Collins has presented uh, before. Um, you know, we allow separating PII types from compliance types and linking them, which allows you to manage your uh, compliance type separately. However, today you still need to manually uh, annotate all the PII types and this takes time and the time to value is quite large uh, once you adopt Data Hub to actually realize all the compliance use cases. Uh, but next slide, Maggie. Um, coming uh, very soon, our connectors for SQL sources and S3 data lake will automatically detect PII types during ingestion. Columns will be associated with predefined glossary terms. Uh, and in the first version, we'll support info types like age, gender, and other info types that you can see listed here. And we'll continuously add support for more info types. Um, next slide. 
So here's a very quick description of the algorithm we use to attach info types to columns. I won't get into details here. Uh, the main thing to take away is there is a possibility that we can attach multiple info types to a given column because you can have JSON snippets and whatnot. So we compute the confidence levels for each info type uh, after uh, you know running a different algorithm, which I'll explain in a bit. And if it's above a certain threshold, then we associate that glossary term with the column. So you could actually end up with multiple glossary terms associated with the column. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is how we uh, actually determine if a particular info type applies to a given column. So we, uh, we actually compute several different parameters like regex match on column name, description, the data type, and finally extracting sample values and invoking a, a machine learning based classification library like Spacey, uh, you know, which uses uh, pre-trained models to actually do named entity recognition. And then using a combination of all these different confidence levels, we compute an overall confidence level, um, which we then, uh, you know, use to determine if this info type is applicable for this column. There's a very simple config file that Data Hub admins can use to tweak the regexes or the weights associated with the different parameters or even add additional info types. So this is meant to be a, a very simple extensible system. And we're really looking forward to contributions from the community also because of the extensibility of this. Next slide, please. So this is all exciting. When is it coming? Uh, this is a client only change. So in an upcoming actual data hub client release, which is probably happening in the next week or so, the Snowflake connector as a starting point will have support for classification. We will follow that up with support for other SQL sources like BigQuery, Redshift and, that, and others, and even the S3 data lake. Uh, we do need uh, to extract sample values from some of these sources for the classification to be somewhat accurate. So, and depending on the type of the source, we have to make some extensions. That's why this is not uh, just automatic. We need a little bit of work. Um, and you also will see support for other info types that are listed here, like US SSN and driving license number and so on. So bottom line is this is built to be uh, an extensible system. And, you know, and obviously it's the first release. So we're really looking forward to hearing feedback from the community about the accuracy of this. And also looking forward to receiving contributions for more info types and uh, you know, have build a really comprehensive library within Data Hub so that right out of the box, you get rich PII type detection. That's it. Thank you very much. All right. Um, and we do have a quick demo of this. This is the demo run of uh, automated glossary term detection. First, how do we enable this? So here is Snowflake recipe. We have added this classification section. We can enable, disable it and uh, also specify the confidence level threshold uh, with which we want to enable classification. Optionally, we can also add patterns which tables we need to classify that is detect glossary terms for. Next, let's run this recipe. So now the pipeline has finished successfully. If we scroll through the logs, we will see that some glossary terms were suggested. For example, for sex, the gender term was suggested with 0.9 confidence interval and so on. There'll be some more. So now let's go to Data Hub UI and uh, see which tables may got the glossary terms let's say something human 
so there is this human stable great so email column has been attached the glossary term email address any more okay here email address as well as age columns were automatically assigned glossary terms okay gender age uh, for the pet also were automatically assigned terms okay thank you all righty um, so that wraps it up for our town hall. Thanks so much, folks, for um, hanging out for a few minutes extra. Um, so there's a question in chat. How is the system, how would the system deal with false positives? Can the terms be backed out and not picked up again on the next run? Um, so can you address that one? Yeah, so, you know, providing feedback on uh, false positives uh, and adjusting for the next run, those kinds of things for relevant feedback is on our roadmap. Uh, for now, since these are minted as glossary terms, you can dismiss them uh, if it's not applicable. Uh, and of course, it will come back if you run it again. Uh, but in the future, we will take that into account and not publish it again. Alrighty, so that's it for today, folks. Uh, we will stick around for a minute or two if there are any other trailing questions. But otherwise, thank you so much for your time and your attention. We always love putting together these sessions and just really love the engagement. Um, this has been a, an awesome round. And also, again, big shout out to Divya. Thanks so much for uh, sharing the, the amazing work the Stripe team is doing. Uh, and we'll see you all in October during spooky season. Maybe we'll have a costume party. Who knows? Huh? I'll dress up my dogs. <laughs> you should totally do that. Costume contest. A costume contest at Town Hall. Let's do it. Yes. Oh, man. Dress up as your favorite ingestion source. The sequel That's... parsing boogeyman will be present. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, folks, I think we will call it. Thank you much. Enjoy the rest of your week, and we will see you on the internet, people. Adios.